Let me get right into my sermon now here in the Gospel of Luke chapter 10. I'll probably follow my notes a little closer today than I normally do. I did read in church history that Jonathan Edwards read his sermon by <coughs> candlelight. The great sermon centers in the hands of an angry God. And as he read it, people screamed in terror at the thought of dying lost. And held on to the post and walls of the building to keep from slipping into hell. So if Jonathan Edwards could follow his notes that closely and have that kind of result, I'll follow mine as closely as I need to. A community, yea, even our community, is greatly blessed. If we have uh, in our community an active, effective rescue squad program, I wonder today by way of survey, how many in this room, by raising your hands, can declare that you at some time in your life experienced were helped by a rescue squad coming to your assistance? Would you raise your hand? Up goes my hand. They came to our two-story home over in Mississippi when I had the severe case of the COVID to rescue me. I have this Meniere's disease that causes my head to swim around. The disease uh, being attacked by the COVID uh, caused me to collapse in the bathroom. I fell like a timber between the wall and the commode. I wedged down in that position, basically passed out. They sent two young women uh, to rescue me. They were incapable physically of doing so. They couldn't unwedge me from where I was positioned. They called for another team from the fire department. Two burly strong men came with the right equipment and the muscular tenacity to do so and lifted me out. They put me in a chair that uh, rolled from step to step, <clears throat> jar to jar, down to the lower level. <clears throat> I had been unconscious, but that trip woke me up. And they transported me on over to the hospital. So I've been blessed to have been rescued. Let me ask one other question. Do we have anybody here today who presently or at some time in the past has been a member of a rescue squad? Would you raise your hand? Anybody? That makes us feel better. Now one brother here is 97 years old. He might not be able to help us. Amen. But he has in the past. <laughs> So we are benefited by such a team. By definition, a rescue company is a public service organization that uses specialized equipment and knowledge they might have to rescue people. It is applied in two areas of their expertise. First of all, these squads rescue trapped people. These teams are normally associated with the fire department or they work independently non-fire rescues such as motor vehicle wrecks, industrial accidents, or natural disasters. The second type of team uh, would be those who come to the aid in times of medical emergencies. These squads are typically known as EMS or emergency medical service people. They operate from ambulances providing emergency care after trauma or care and help for those who have medical needs. And such squads may provide either basic or advanced life support. The staff of these agencies can possess any number of certifications, including uh, being a first responder or an emergency medical technician or even a paramedic. So what is the purpose of uh, these aforenamed rescue squads? these people who thus participate in trying to get to folks and help them? Is it their responsibility merely to punch a clock so many hours can be counted toward their salary? Is it their responsibility to endure a daily schedule once they're on the job or to keep the equipment properly serviced and maintained? 
or to wear neatly identifiable uniforms or to earn uh, more advanced certificates and degrees or go through mock drills and training or to spend time in recreation when they're not making a run or to eat meals uh, that are prepared and served where they may do their work. No. As good as all uh, and as necessary as all these features might be, they have one purpose, they have one goal, one role in mind. Their goal is to rescue those who are in need as successfully as they can possibly do so. And along with that, I want to stress emphatically, it is also their goal to shorten the amount of time between a call coming for help and the team actually arriving on the scene to do the help. The shorter the time, the more lives can be saved. When I pastored the old church over near home, we have a dear fellow there, if he were soaking wet and weighed himself, he might clock out at about 95 pounds. But he's worked uh, like a Trojan through the years, uh, caring for a massive cattle farm and pecan orchard. Much of that work he has done through the years by himself. Not long ago, he was off on the back pasture land trying to assist a, a cow to give birth to a calf. Things didn't go just right, so the mama cow turned on him, ran over him, and landed on him. Well, there he was, being crushed to death by a massive animal. He happened to have his cell phone, had enough consciousness and awareness of the crisis to hit the 911. Now, hear me today, it didn't take him but 10 minutes to get out there to him. Had it taken him, uh, had it taken them 20 minutes or 30 minutes, instead of finding him still breathing, though crushed, they would have found him dead, crushed to death. Now what is my <clears throat> emphasis here today? I'm here to tell us today that uh, we as the church happen to be God's rescue squad. We're not here simply to meet together for fellowship and enjoy one another's company or to keep these wonderful buildings and equipment properly maintained or to have the teaching and preaching and singing sessions that we so much enjoy, or to serve and consume these fine meals that we'll have just a week from now. We're here to go out from here. You know, we're... In a wounded world who will die if we don't get to them before they stop breathing. So that's what we have here in the Bible today in the story of the Good Samaritan. We have a biblical example of God's rescue squad. Let me read to you again what was read uh, on the screen just a bit ago. In verse 25, Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted, that is, tested Christ, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Oh my, he asked the big question, did he not? The eternal life question. Jesus said unto him, What is written in the law, how readest thou? This man designated a lawyer was not an attorney such as you and I consider one to be today. He was an expert in Jewish law. He knew the Bible. He had been raised uh, and taught uh, in a, a circumstance where the Bible was more or less the priority of his education. He knew the law, what it said, and how it read. The answering said, uh, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, strength, and mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And Jesus said to him, You've answered right or correctly this do, and thou shalt live. Don't get the idea that any man from his human vantage point and the innate strength that you might somehow generate on your own 
can love God as you should, nor your neighbor as you ought. It can only be done by divine intervention in the depraved soul. Jesus is not implying, much less teaching directly, that we as human beings can love God as we should without knowing God, or love our neighbor as we should without God uh, enabling us to do so. So the question uh, was raised uh, concerning who the neighbor is. It says in verse 28, uh, Thou hast answered right this do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said to Jesus, Who is my neighbor? There are three attitudes we're about to consider in, in the Good Samaritan story. One attitude says, What is mine <clears throat> is mine. I intend to keep it under all circumstances and never share it. That is the attitude, what is yours is mine, and I intend to take it, no matter if you're hurt in the process. And then there is the attitude um, of, the, uh, of the good Samaritan who says, what is mine is yours, and I will gladly share it that your need might be met. One preacher said there are three attitudes here that are summarized uh, briefly. The attitude beat him up, and that's what the thieves did. The attitude, pass him up, that's what the priest and Levite do. The attitude, lift him up, as manifested in the Good Samaritan. Let me give you briefly the story outlined by chapter. That is the chapter in verse 30 entitled, Calamity. It says, Jesus said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. We find here the direction to travel was downward. Jericho was a 12 mile descent from Jerusalem. We see here the danger he encountered is described as falling among thieves. It was not a wild animal that hurt him. Then I, not a bear, nor a lion, nor a wolf lingering in the dark shadows nearby that attack him. Nor is it true today in our current world. It's not the animal kingdom that's doing the thieving, the attacking, and the hurting. And we can manage everything but the snakes. Amen, Eric? <laughs> but uh, it says here, he fell among thieves. We find from history that when Herod was building the Jerusalem temple, when King Herod built the magnificent temple he brought in from Hiranyan 40,000 slave laborers. They were the uh, workers that put up the temple. And as a political gesture, when it was completed, they had a dedication day and to sort of uh, give himself right staying among those he had so cruelly enslaved to work like they did. He emancipated 40,000 slaves into society with no place to go, no job, no home, nothing to sustain themselves. So they just went hither and yon trying to survive. And a lot of them could be found between Jerusalem on the road down to Jericho and they made the living stealing from people. And so this Jewish man was accosted by one of these thieves, if not more than one. The disaster he experienced is described as being stripped of his belongings. They took what they considered to be valuable, hurting him in the process. I see him representing those to whom we must go today in the ditches all about us, beaten down and robbed. The devil, the enemy of their souls, the thief from hell, has taken from them all that's valuable and worthwhile and meaningful. And the folks you work with, and the people in your family, and the stranger you meet at the gas station all around you, you just wonder behind the facade of their, their activity at that current moment what their life's all about. And maybe... Just maybe if you could say a word to him about Jesus and his love and how he changed your life. He can change anybody's life who will let him do so. 
It would amaze you how this church someday would just overflow with people who have been rescued from the ditches that you and I encounter every day. So that's the calamity. I think it's interesting, David, uh, you can give me the theology on this. When is a fellow dead if he's half dead? I mean, if you get to be 51% dead, are you dead? <laughs> you can work that out. I do know one thing. If somebody doesn't help him pretty quick, he's going to be 100% dead. He's on the border, brother. He's going to have to have some help. And if he doesn't get it, he'll be in the next world. So you have the calamity. Then I see in verses 31 and 32 the complacency, the coldness, the calluses. Look what it says in verse 31. And by chance there came a certain priest that way when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. One author said, uh, between Jerusalem and Jericho, ministering back and forth, were some 12,000 priests at one time when the number was the greatest. What was a priest's job in the Jewish economy? He was to represent God to the people and the people to God. I can see this dying Jew there in the ditch through blood-stained eyes and aching body. Look up with hope. Yonder comes a priest. Yonder comes a man of God. Yonder comes somebody that can help me. And how disappointed that man must have been in his heart. When the Jew didn't even come over close to him to help him, even though he was a priest. Huh? My calling, then, is calling our children's calling. It's not just to be um, a vocational professional. We're here to help people come to God. And the only hope some folks have is that person standing between them and God who can say to them, here's how you can know and find God yourself. So the priest passed him by. Then he goes on to say in verse 32, Likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. These Levites were assistants to the priest. They took up the money. They kept the building maintained. They uh, handled the holy vessels. They were helpers. They were assistants. They were being mentored. And evidently he had learned from the priest the passing by approach to the help, to the folks that need help. It would amaze you, Mom and Daddy, it would amaze us today, grandparents, how much our children and grandchildren learn from us by what we do regarding those who have such need in the dying ditches about us. We teach by our actions more so than we do our words. And our reaction is a great teacher in our home city. So may God help us to be an example so that our children will follow in our footsteps to help those who are dying. Now we come to the third chapter of the great drama. The word is found in the verse, verse 33, the word compassion says in 33, a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. Now, who was this Samaritan? What was his uh, situation in life? What was his identity? He is the man, uh, I will say, by summary, most unlikely to help, especially to help the Jew who is dying. The history of it is this. Years before, the northern kingdom of Israel had been conquered and occupied by the Assyrians, a foreign power. The Assyrian colonists had been brought in to populate the land, who in turn began to intermarry with the Jews. These mixed-race marriages and their descendants became known as the Samaritans. They even built a rival temple on Mount Gerizim and used their own version of the Hebrew Pentateuch. The tension between the native Israelites who returned from Babylonian captivity and the Samaritans grew worse and worse and more intense through the years. It was finally brought to head when uh, one of the kings destroyed the temple on Mount Gerizim in 128 B.C. Thus there was an ongoing animosity and hostility between the purebred Jews and the mixed-race Samaritans at the time of Christ on earth. The last person on earth 
the last one uh, this wounded Jew expected to come to his rescue would be this approaching Samaritan. But evidently God had worked in the Samaritan's heart to the extent he was a man of compassion, even toward a man who would otherwise be passed by. The three great truths here in verse 33, he came where he was. He didn't uh, skirt about him. He didn't pass by at a distance away. It says when he saw him, which means he really saw him as a human being in need of help. I remember the story when D.L. Moody had the great church in Chicago in its founding years. A little street urchin, a little boy in rags was moving along rapidly on the sidewalk. He went past a big uh, church on one location and another and finally a policeman stopped and said, why are you in such a hurry and why did you not go into the church you just passed? He said, I'm going to Mr. Moody's church. And the policeman said, why are you going there? You've passed two churches already. He said, they really love a fellow like me at Mr. Moody's church. And all across the cater in this area, when folks think a city church, and they pass others by if they happen to do so, may it be because they know over here they can be loved. And no matter how they might be wounded and rejected and crippled down and hopeless, if they can get over here somehow and get in touch with some of the folks who are part of this, they know that there's healing on the way. He had compassion on him. Let me summarize it right quick because I'm running out of my time here. <clears throat> Let me give you the thought of the carrying cost what it costs to care. I'll just list it off for you. You can look at that closely. It cost the Samaritan in time. He broke his own schedule and gave priority to the man in the ditch. It cost him in treatment, for he applied oil to soothe the wounds and the wine to fight infection. It cost him in transportation because he placed the wounded man on his personal donkey. He provided the vehicle. He didn't worry about the man's blood and mud soiling his saddle. I love to tell this. Back when we lived in Marion County on the tall hill, down at the base of the hill in a little trailer house lived a large, big bone woman, Sister Jones. And she would probably weighed in pretty heavy around 250 or so. Great big frame woman. But a sweet, gentle soul she was, David. And she wanted to go to church every time they had church, not just on Sunday morning, but night and Wednesday night. She'd even try to show up if she could to some other men's meeting. She wasn't careful. But anyway, Miss Sandy, big as she is, wanted to make sure Sister Jones got to church, so she committed to carry her in the tercel. <laughs> you know what a tercel is? That's a toy that they made real little. It is made for people the size of my wife. Four foot, 11, 10 and a half, <clears throat> 9,500 pounds one time. <laughs> Y'all hang with me now. So she wheels into Sister Jones's yard, and she had a grassless yard, North Alabama red clay <clears throat> yard. And when it rained, brother, you know what North Alabama red clay does? It becomes red cement, right? Sister Jones will come out on the front porch. This is how she moved now. She made one step every 10 seconds. <clears throat> Walking stick down the steps. So Sandy had to go try to get her down the steps. You know what that kind of does to your Sunday shoes now, ladies? Walking across the mud. And this one, the old Tercel, we bought this thing new. We had worked up some saving money, and we bought her a new Toyota Tercel. And she was proud of it and took pride in it and washed it regularly and kept it clean inside and out. But she helped Sister Joan across the mud of the yard. Got her up in the car. She put that part of it in there first. And she put one leg in next and then the next leg in next. And finally, she had to help that last leg get in finally. And in it came with all the mud all over that to herself. But that didn't matter. What's mud? 
when you're trying to help somebody who wants to go to church, get there if you can provide them a way to do so. One of the great tragedies in the church community today are the half-filled vehicles all outside these walls today. There are a lot of people that would be here if somebody has said, I know you can't drive. I know you can't drive safely, <laughs> at least. But if you'll be ready, I'll come by and pick you up. Isn't there a lot of folks like that? A lot of them don't have family anymore that care much about them. But if somebody here in this church would say, I'll go by and pick them up, I'll use my donkey to get them to the hospital of the soul. So there's a cost in transportation, a cost in thoughtfulness. It says it took care of him. Let me get over here to the last. There's a cost in tomorrow. He said, I'm going to leave now, but I'll come again. There's a cost in treasure. The two pence was two days' of salary. He said, I'll pay more when I come back and check on him. So we invest here in this building and all that's going on here. Why? Because the soul will never die. There was a time when you did not exist, but there'll never be a time when you exist no more. You're as eternal as God is today, the creator of your soul. Now, John, when this building ceased to exist and our vehicles are in the junk pile and our bodies no longer are the habitation of our soul, these people we're trying to reach will live somewhere forever. And it's our challenge to get the gospel to them while there's still time. To, let me close this and I'll quit. You may wonder, I don't guess you do, but I think you probably wonder, how in the world did the Hudson Bunch get in life where we are today as far as where it all started? Let me tell you this real quick. When my mom and I were at home, and my daddy is in the military far away, there's a man in our neighborhood who was a day laborer carpenter by trade, Mr. Jack Crawford. He owned a woody side Ford station wagon. And he'd go out on Saturdays, door to door, and invite folks to go to church and said if they're willing to go, they could ride in the in the station wagon. And he knocked on our door. And Mama put him off several times because he didn't feel like we had anything really fit to wear to church. Mama made me a new shirt out of a flyer sack. She was a seamstress, put that new shirt on me. She dipped it in starch, made it so stiff, made my neck raw when I was trying to wear it. She had starched my blue jeans so stiff, it's like trying to wear two stovepipes on when I tried to move around. I dressed up and ready to roll. And my mom and I, before we had a car, before we had much of this world except ourselves, we got in that old station wagon jammed full of people rode to that little church in town and heard the gospel. And God saved us. And that's where the story began. A few years back, over one of the fish restaurants outside of our hometown, went out there to eat. And believe it or not, sitting there in his feeble days was old brother Jack Crawford. <laughs> and I stepped up to him. And I tapped on the, the glass there with the fork, got the attention of folks around. And I said, I'd like to say this word. Everybody give me just a minute. And I said, here's a man years ago that God used to bring us to Jesus to tell us that life could be different. And I just want you all to know about him. Not long after that, he succumbed to the death hand, went out to rest in the world beyond the last heartbeat. And someday... We will rejoice together again. So you can be that good Samaritan. There's not a one of us in this room who's a Christian. But what God can use you to bear a good witness and do what you can by God's help to res rescue somebody that's dying in the ditch.